taking the path of least resistance when implementing new features in a large existing code base turns it into a hard to change turd pile. It's a vicious circle. Making the quick change makes it harder to do changes in the future. So what's the solution? To me, it's about being aware of technical debt, understanding there's more than just data involved, and giving yourself options in your software architecture. Let me explain. Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design, so if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So what do I really mean by the path of least resistance? So let's say we have some client, this could be a web app, and we have some web API, some HTTP API that we're interacting with. We have some application code, some domain in our database. Now the thing is, is that there really is kind of all these little pieces throughout all these different layers or tiers within our system. So when we do need to make a change, generally we're making it through the entire stack. So when we're doing that, there may be a couple pieces in the client that we need to change. This could be some just components. This could be pages. In our web API, maybe there's a couple different controllers or different routes that we need to change for this, this new feature that we're adding. In our application code, there's changes that we need to make there, something within our domain that we potentially need to change, and then obviously all the way back to our database and whatever our database is. So there's kind of through the entire stack that we need to, to make changes to implement this new feature. Now I'm talking about path of least resistance. It usually somewhat relates to time, meaning it's the least time consuming, as well as for a developer, if they're thinking this way, they're probably in a system that is maybe feels a little bit brittle and they're afraid to make changes that would break other features. So they don't wanna have any type of regression. So the path of least resistance is that, is kind of making a change that you know is not gonna break anything, but it's not necessarily ideal. It's ideal to you because it's, you know you potentially have less likelihood of breaking something and you can make that change done uh, quickly. So it's really not necessarily about easy or difficult. And I don't really like those terms because to me, the least time consuming still can be difficult if especially if you're making changes through different layers or parts of your system. Now that's not to say that taking the path of least resistance is inherently bad. It's not to me if you're knowing and accepting of it. And I really equate, uh, equate this to technical debt is depending on, there's a lot of factors here. Let's say that you're in a startup, you're trying to get some type of proof of concept out, doing whatever you need to do to validate your ideas. There's a whole pile of reasons to be doing this, but you're aware of it. You're cognizant of, I'm making a change right now. That's the path of least resistance. I don't want to spend any more time maybe kind of rewriting or changing the model or changing some of the architecture that we have that better fits this. Maybe the value's not there. Maybe you don't know yet, but you're aware of what you're doing and you're not willing to spend the time to investigate other approaches or other solutions that may be more beneficial to you in the future. So that's the key is that you're doing something for the now, regardless of the future. You're doing it so you have a future potentially. So on the flip side is just being oblivious and unaware of taking the path of least resistance on how you're implementing a feature and that it may hinder you in the future or it may even hinder you now on how you're implementing it. You're just oblivious to what you're doing. And I find this is in a system that's already hard to change and what developers do is they just look for existing features that they can piggyback off of. Something that's already there that looks very similar or is doing something very close to what they wanna do and they'll just kind of change it a little bit or add something here and there to something that's already existing and kind of conflating two different concepts into one thing that's already existing. Or it's looking at how an existing feature is implemented and literally replicating that, but for their own feature. It may not be ideal. It's not really thought through. You're just taking again, the path of least resistance to get something implemented as quickly as you can. Now, regardless of whether you're aware or unaware of the technical debt that you're adding, to me, having a software architecture that it gives you options to make changes in the future, to evolve your system, it really is key. I'll have a link in the description for a video that I've done on this, talking about kind of optionality and how it applies to software architecture and how it allows you to evolve your system. 
specifically when you're knowingly taking on technical debt. So another reason why I think developers have to go down this road of making the quickest possible change, the path of least resistance, is because the system is built thinking primarily at first about data and not about capabilities and behaviors. The idea here is that if you're focused solely on entities and kind of be all end all of like there's one concept of a product in our system, you're gonna get a high degree of coupling, things are gonna get hard to change, and you're gonna go down the road a path of least resistance. And what I mean by that is I always use the example of a product, and there's different ones that I've used in different videos, but I always say that a product isn't a product. And when I was working in kind of distribution warehouse um, type systems, yes, there's the idea of a product, but that concept exists in multiple different boundaries and has different kind of meanings to different people that work in the system and working within the organization. There isn't just one idea of a product. People care about different things. And if you build your system that way, focused on what people care about, you can split that concept up in many different ways. So a product isn't a product. A product just doesn't have all these concepts that everybody cares about. There's things like the SKU, the name, the description. Those are kind of one grouping. There's something like the price, the SKU, and the available for sale. There's other ideas of kind of the cost and whether something's available to purchase. There's the location of that product, or the quantity on hand in the warehouse. And the reason is, is because depending where you are at in that system, there's different boundaries that you have and different people care about different things. If you're solely th thinking about data alone, yes, you're gonna end up with one concept of a product. But if you start thinking about the capabilities of what your system's providing, the actual behaviors, then you start splitting things up so you're not having a single concept of a product. So for example, the warehouse has the idea of shipping and receiving product doing inventory adjustments. It's focused on those things that relate then to the quantity on hand and the location. Same thing with sales. When we're sales focused, we're thinking about customers. We're thinking about the sale price. When we're talking about purchasing, purchasing isn't thinking about the sale price. They're thinking about, they're more vendor centric. They're thinking about kind of the vendor, the manufacturer, and what the cost is of what we have to pay to get the product. Um, and whether we can even purchase that product anymore. And then there's generic information, maybe like kind of like the catalog here where I have just the name, the description, et cetera. Now, the thing is, is again, it isn't one product. There's multiple ideas or concepts of a product that exist within our system. And they are driven by capabilities of what we're gonna do in those specific parts, those specific boundaries within our system. Now, like I mentioned in most videos, directly or indirectly, this comes down to coupling. If you have a system here that has a bunch of different functionality, imagine it's a really large system and there is no rhyme or reason in terms of cohesion and you just have this large massive database and large tables, then yes, you're gonna have features that are all over the place that are highly coupled to each other because it's just a free for all. There is no cohesion. You have a high degree of coupling and low cohesion. And I talk about this so much is that you need to kind of start uniforming and grouping things and having some high degree of functional cohesion. So that means it's breaking things apart, focusing on capabilities so that you can start segregating things that these features belong together because they work on the same tasks, the range, same groupings, and then the data behind that. If you can do that, then you can start tearing this kind of hard to change system that has a high degree of coupling into more smaller bite-sized modules, even if it's a monolith. You can start breaking things into a little bit, being a little bit more modular and a little bit more having focus on sections about what the application actually does. Now, when developers take the path of least resistance, in my experience, they're usually looking at the data structure first and foremost. So they look at an existing feature that they want to piggyback off of because the data looks the same. Never mind that the behavior is completely separate and the concept of what they're trying to implement is completely separate from what they're piggybacking off of. And that's why you end up with a database, for example, or um, an object, or a, a document that has hundreds of properties or a table that has hundreds of columns. This is why this happens because over time, kind of like a death by a thousand paper cuts, all features are implemented this way and they're all trying to leverage the same functionality and you just end up with a, a really a turd pile that's really hard to change. So if you're completely unaware and you're oblivious to what you're doing, yes, over time, a system becomes a turd pile. It doesn't start out that way. You're adding new features and over time, it just becomes a monstrosity that's hard to change. 
But if you are aware of it, you can manage it. It starts off small. We're not going to do everything perfect. There's a lot of reasons why you may take the path of least, least resistance and you're aware of it. So as you're doing that, you can realize, okay, we're getting, we're getting a little bit bigger. Let's manage this. Let's do some refactoring. Let's think about some of the problems that we previously implemented that maybe there's more value if we kind of change how that's done and reduce some of that technical debt. Keep doing this. Uh-oh, we've, we've added more. We've had to make some decisions that are adding technical debt and then manage it. But if you're aware of it and you're aware you're making this, these decisions, then you should be aware that you can reduce them and, and pay back some of that debt. If you let things go too far, that's when the let's rewrite everything conversations start happening. Versus if you are cognizant, if you're aware and you have architecture that gives you options, that lets you evolve your system, you won't get into those conversations of let's rewrite everything. Your system will be continuously evolving. I'm not saying that taking the path of least resistance isn't something you should ever do. It absolutely is in the right context, but be aware that you're doing it. If you want to talk to other developers about software architecture design and some of the concepts that I'm talking about today, you can do so by joining my channel. Check out the links in the description and get access to a private Discord server. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.